All right. Well, welcome to the Enterprising Minds podcast. Uh, typically, we have Ruthie Corcoran, but she is out today. So with me is Dave Doherty and me, Alex Picorni. So we have one topic for the day, and it's going to be a unique one. Uh, we'll definitely dive into it and see kind of some different viewpoints around it, as well as where it hits in everyone's life as an SEO. So mm-hmm. topic today is the creative SEO, oxymoron or true definition. Um, basically, talking a little bit about um, the creative process and how that creativity inspires us as SEOs. Is it really a necessary component to our jobs or does it have to be there? And then we'll get into a little bit about kind of technical SEO versus content SEO. And is that split a good thing and some other topics too? So mm-hmm. Dave, do you want to start us off on kind of what your thoughts are around it? Yeah. So um, I don't think it's an oxymoron. Um I think you're a moron if you don't think of it as a holistic <laughs> SEO, actually. <laughs> uh, so now that we're done with the soundbite, we can, uh, <laughs> I think with a lot of what we're seeing in the marketplace and a lot of trends that I'm seeing with you know, the, the job recs in the, the digital marketing space and um, some of the news from talking to friends around the industry, it just seems like we're getting more and more and more siloed over specific things, right? Like yeah. um, seeing seeing jobs for, you know, conversion rate, optimiz- you know, optimization as your sole job. It's like that, that to me seems like an oxymoron because that is the definition of marketing activities. Like if you are not doing that, you're not marketing. Um, so, you know, it, we've been hearing for years and years and years, you know, the, the, the riches are in the niches, but if you go too deep, right. Or too specialized in any kind of role, there are some, some downsides. And especially when it comes to SEO, I feel like, um, it has to be more holistic. Um, when you are hiring though, of course, you're going to have more of a technical person. You're going to have more of a creative person. Sure. And again, there are drawbacks to both, but that's why I think, uh, if you think you can get by with only like a single SEO, depending on the size of your organization or what you're trying to do, uh, you yeah. might be fooling yourself. Like you might want to have the two people playing around with each other to, to do the technical and the, the creative, but it's not impossible to have both in a single individual, you know? Yeah, I think it's a difficulty in a couple areas. So one is kind of how SEO is seen by the organization when there isn't a pre-existing SEO team or leader Mm -hmm. or even a knowledgeable individual who just at least understands the concepts of it. Who sees SEO as sometimes as accessibility slash SEO slash requirements that are enhancements of the websites that are required. Right. And there's the other side of it that says, you know, this is a marketing promotions function, and this is something that we're doing to get more traffic and we're getting more customers through it, and we're trying to increase the, our pipeline through it. Mm-hmm. And depending on how that role is basically kind of set up, it can be siloed into one of those versus the other one. Are you just checking off the checkboxes and going down the list of standards that should be done for best practices sake? The phrase best practices always bugs me, but moving on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> are you looking at like the, the campaign side of it and saying, we're doing SEO for pure traffic volume. And what we're caring about is traffic volume, but not necessarily about site best practices or standards or something like that. Right. And I think that's exactly it. Is that is a little bit almost of the, the oxymoron statement right there of thinking that these things are siloed, thinking that these things should be separated. And also from an SEO standpoint of if you grew up in a career where you're put in one of those two boxes, that's a bad idea because right. SEO is by its very nature, a holistic venture because if the page doesn't load, if it's a four or four, it's kind of the partnership with it kind of analogy. If mm-hmm. the page doesn't load, who cares how good of your metadata was or how good the content is? The page is down. No one's going to see it. And if you make a great page, but no one ever visits it, what was the point of that effort? So you have to do both of the traffic side of it and the site standards kind of side and technical side of it. And then, I don't know. I think the other thing is it becomes 
stifling as an SEO, especially as you maybe mature a little bit more in your career and you understand a little bit more about you know, all the different areas and opportunities. And if you're being boxed in, I think that leads to burnout. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, it it comes to, to mind, and I know we've talked about this, you know, on record or at a coffee shop, you know, um, as, as we've hung out. Um, for me, SEO really is more about the digital business strategy, right? right? If you are going to be a digital first organization, you have to be thinking along the lines of SEO. Yep. Right off the bat, because, you know, you have to have the proper website, the content you create, depending on, you know, your business model, like if you're e-commerce, yep. you have to have all that data syndicating and syndica- yep. syndicating perfectly. Um, you, yeah, you have to be so close to perfect now with all of the different ranking factors um, yep. that you are at a competitive disadvantage when you when you don't focus on that or when you don't lead with what's the digital experience you know um i was reflecting on this a little bit ago because you know 10 15 whenever it was years ago when we you know started out um the big conversation there was at least in the agency world when i was doing the consulting was um you know, our business is based off of X, Y, Z, right? Relationships, shaking hands, doing the local, um, oh, what's it called? The local commerce, you know, community commerce things. Sure. Right? Um, and it's like, okay, but that's, that's detrimental to the long game. Right. Mm -hmm. But convincing people that, no, your business model needs to change. I mean, it took that whole amount of time and then the pandemic to switch some of these people's minds. (laughs) Oh, yeah. I was thinking there's um, one of the agencies I was with. We had a variety of clients, a lot of contractors, uh, small Mm -hmm. businesses. Um, And there was this point I kept trying to make to them about offline competition versus online competition. And there's always like a mindset shift that finally sometimes made that thing click sometimes it didn't but there's the point of let's say you're Bob the painter and i'm alex the seo and i have to write a blog about how good of a job i was doing in painting and some how to of how i painted a room in my house right. if i outrank you and i get traffic i am your online competitor mm-hmm. it's like mm-hmm. there was a, a statement from disney a while back talking about how uh, city level soccer teams were c- competition to disney because it was time taken away from those kids who could have been consuming Disney products. <laughs> like their definition of common competitor was just like mind blowingly broad. Right. But when you look at it in an online landscape, that's actually pretty fair. Like if you search for something that is related to your business and somebody else shows up or other people show up next to you, which right. of course they will, they're taking some of that traffic and they are your competitors. If you're looking for a St. Louis painting or how to paint and you're somehow trying to like weasel your way kind of into that and saying, this is a really complex thing. You should hire a painter. You should hire us. That now is a competitor set as well. Those how-to videos are a competitor set now. It's, I think that mindset shift shift is difficult. It's mm-hmm. a hard one for the retailers, the brick and mortar, local service companies to start thinking about what's the online impact here. And yeah, I think you're right with the pandemic that it really shifted a lot of people's mindset. Um, but I think also like the, just the digitally native generations that are coming up that of course, someone's going to look for your business by looking in their phone, not yellow pages, which no one even has in their house anymore. So right. you know, things have, right. things have changed. Things have shifted. Well, and I remember, you know, one of the big arguments then, and it shocks me that I'm still having these, these debates in, in meetings was just the fact that, you know, Hey, leadership the website might be the first brand experience still. Um, yeah. yeah. And it's only getting worse because of the generational turnover and who's coming into positions of um, authority for the purchase decisions. Right. Getting worse by it's getting more important. Well, it's worse for the old school model. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah, um, absolutely. Thanks for the clar clarification there. Yeah, sure. more and more and more people, and you know, there are plenty of studies that show this, want that digital first, don't want to talk to somebody unless I can't find the information yep. that I you know, was looking for, yep. um, or I need to know something super specific and super technical about whatever product it is. So, okay, fine, I'll call. Complex enough of a, a sell. And I'll call right. right. And, you know, so that's something that, you know, okay, the digital experience has to be front and center then. And it, you have to tailor it to the job to be done. And when you do that, you are then rewarded in the search engines, right? Um, and, you know, the more, the more we're seeing with the, the chat GPT or the bar rollouts or, However, AI generative AI changes the way things you know go. It's still going to be trust and relationships with the brands or the organizations that you're choosing to work with, and whether or not uh, you have a good experience with that, right? Yeah. Because it'll be but, too easy to switch over to something else. Yeah, I think it was Will Critchlow who put together a presentation that it's still on SlideShare. Talking about it was like 10 years in SEO or 15 years in SEO or something like that. But he was talking about some of those long-term trends that have been moving across and how like the rise of mobile versus desktop. That was something right. that Google pushed way earlier than really everybody was kind of the pop user population was kind of pushed over. They went quite mm -hmm. transferred over. But Google was already pushing, hey, you need a mobile site, you need to be able to have a, a mobile experience, not just an M dot experience, but an actual you know, responsive site. That kind of leads also to like core web vitals where we start talking about the user experience of the page. If it was really poor, even though the content's good, the backlinks are good, the let's say even the page speed was good, but your content's shifting around constantly, it's really hard to get around all the pop-ups and all the rest, your site's gonna get you know devalued or it's gonna be kind of a, a at least a red flag that you really should be focusing on and changing, which mm -hmm. is pushing that tie between that IT side, that marketing side and saying, are we customer focused? Are we site focused? You know, what are we code focused? What are we focused on? Marketing right. will always say that they're customer focused, but IT probably wouldn't say that. Right. And that's, I think that, that message is changing because that's, that's the business nowadays. It is that competitive. It has to be that good. And those teams that have to be that integrated, which right. getting to that kind of greater point of, the splits we're seeing between content SEO being hired as a different role than technical SEO. I get, I don't know. I, I think I'm with you on that where I, I'm, I get my concerns about it. I always think with silos that you can have fantastic people doing fantastic work, mm -hmm. but there's a multiplier effect when they start to work together. And if you don't break those silos down, you'll do fine. Probably if you have good enough people and good enough product, mm -hmm. but you won't really get the benefit. I don't know. Well, to that point, and you know what you're talking about with the core web vitals and all of that, I really feel like the the vitals are a proxy for the organizational health. Oh yeah. You know, because yeah. if you have yeah. the proper structures in place, you have people <laughs> who are empowered to make choices and and do the edits, uh, means you can respond when yeah. things happen. So, you know, if you go to a site and you see that every page is super slow, that the content is old, uh, there's going to be some back end woe <laughs> um, that, that is preventing those things from being properly done. And what does that say about the business as a whole? Is that something you want to deal with? Maybe, maybe not, you know, are they the only ones with the product? Maybe. You yeah, know, depending on what what the product is. Um, otherwise, if you're able to just you know go to the corner store to buy it instead of you know ordering twelve at a time online, then you know support the bodega. That's <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, um, just, there's, there's a recruiter who reached out to me and had asked if I had experience. There's a couple of CMSs that man throwback like hadn't heard those names in about 10 years and it was like do you have experience with it and it was like three in a row and i was like technically yes over a decade ago yeah. and 
Oh, that says something about the organization. <laughs> they haven't moved on since then. Mm-hmm. You, know, you know, I do wonder this. So, yeah, I don't know. That'd be interesting your opinion of what do you think? Uh, uh, do do you think do you think uh, businesses fully see the website as being the front door of their business? And I mean this in a couple of different ways. So, one a quick story: there is an automotive dealership I worked with. Right. They had a lot of problems with attribution, basically, what, because the very, I mean, handshake sales, that's automotive, right. Right? right? The owner was saying, I don't know if your paid search is actually doing anything, but I do know when I see someone with a newspaper tucked under their arm and a highlighter around a particular car, you know, ad, that that newspaper did something for me. And fair point, but at the same time, the guy was really kind of missing the connection to the website, to the forms, to people who were showing up, like there was a pretty clear path there, but he was, I was just glossed over basically. Mm -hmm. And the other piece about this is I see companies, you know, customer service isn't great. We need to have better customer service, better trained, better hours, accessibility, chatbot, you name it. But there's always that gap of maybe that content should maybe be easier to find on the site. So they wouldn't be reaching out to customer service. Like, Mm -hmm. It's pretty hard for us to really think of a complex a product that is that complex from the person who would be purchasing it. They already have some knowledge. But they'd be so confused that they have to call a salesperson, a customer service person. Or is that just a sign that the, you know, the SEO is or the website is off? And it's like so much of this in my mind always tracks back to the website. Right. But what do you think? Are you do you see businesses really thinking a website is their front door, or are they seeing it as this is a promotional activity. This is a channel. Well, I think the smart ones see it that way. And I think the ones that are doing well, um, you know, that have the premiums on the, on the stocks are, are the ones that are adopting the digital uh, side of things. And, you know, I hate to play into the, the sort of status quo, but if you look at the, consumer packaged goods, right? Everybody likes to use those as the ones because they're sexy. Um, they have the digital experiences, right? Um, and it is about the, not just building the awareness, but, you know, are you the type of person that wears, you know, Gucci over Prada over, you know, um, do you, do you not care and you buy both, right? Um, what is that? What does that end up saying? Same thing with, you know, sports organizations. Um, Mm -hmm. They have a really strong digital presence because it's not just about the team. It's about developing that community and the fandom, different levels of of being fans of the organization that way. All of it is the the touch points there. Um, You know, really old school organizations are not immune to it. I think what the New York Times has done has been really um good in that respect you know you might not want the newspaper anymore but you can still read it on the app or get a couple articles a month or you're the type of person that really wants to play wordle or any of these you know prism games or whatever other things they offer so you know they have their their gaming division you know it's what does that have to do with newspapers yeah, they, not they, a whole they, lot. I mean, they had the crossword forever and ever in a day, but um, you know, on the face of it, that's not what you'd immediately associate with it. But they've been transforming really nicely over the last ten years. Yeah, they're a rare, I think, example with a lot of the print, especially newspaper side of things, has gone so far downhill. And like, how how much do you gate your content when you you know push that five free article viewing limit or subscription limits, you know, that sort of thing. But yeah, like their purchase of wire cutter, that was huge. Of you know, you're looking for product reviews and you know, techie product review, webcam right. reviews. And, and the stuff that consumer public. reports is not, you know, covering. Right? Yeah. And they're not they're not fresh enough. Uh consumer reports, it's a nice nonprofit organization, does get things from the consumer side of things, uh consumer advocacy side, but you know, how relevant can they really be when you can look at Amazon reviews that somebody threw in a review five minutes ago and they're trying to review blunders once a year. Hey, sorry, things things change faster than that. 
Mm -hmm. It's, I think it is a different, a difficult model to shift into, especially with those pre-existing businesses. Right. Uh, There's a, this was a digital first company, but it was a clothing brand and it was the CEO kind of reminiscing on kind of the story of when they, when they started and they had mentioned, you know, who is this person? Where do they shop? What kind of things do they like to buy? You know, where do Mm -hmm. they hang out? It was refreshing to hear that a CEO was thinking about the customer in terms right. of who is this individual? Who are we going after? And in your point about a sports team, I was thinking about that pretty hard. It was That's a tough one because you think of your product as being a winning championship getting team. Right. But is that where the money comes in? <laughs> because the money comes in from merchandise sales, ticket sales, I mean, and every other sponsorship, partnership, you advertising thing, you name it. Mm-hmm. And that's that's a tough mindset shift. I mean, to say like, yes, our product is great football or great baseball or great what you know, pick your sport. Mm-hmm. But our customer is this fan. And who is this customer? How do we get them attracted? How do we get them interested? How do we keep them involved? You know. Lifetime customer value, just think of that side of it. Like, how do you get them to be right. season ticket holders? That's such a different, a different conversation that it almost seems like two parts of a business, but it shouldn't be. It should be one part of the business. One mm-hmm. understands both. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I think to, to one, circling back to one of your earlier points on um, whether or not somebody calling in is a, is a failure or something or not. I think it also really, yeah, it also really, really depends on what product you're selling, right? In the super regulated industries, right? Mm -hmm. I'm thinking chemical, I'm thinking finance, I'm that kind of stuff. You're going to want to make sure that, okay, this product meets such and such legal requirement so that I can keep my, um, keep my employees safe when they're mixing pharmaceuticals or whatever it is. Right. Um, that is a very particular use case that you're going to want to support through other, other things, right. You can get it so far. Um, but part of that is also, you know, product data, right. Mm -hmm. Um, where in the customer journey is it? where in your website services that particular, you know, element of the journey. Um, Yeah, you're going to want to have a physical, a physical conversation there. And it's not any different than the the text messages that you, me and Ruthie were sending on, um, you know, retail the other day, where we were saying, yeah, you know, some of these new digital first uh, Instagram first, even <laughs> not even fully digital, but Instagram first yeah. uh, brands that are now opening up stores in malls or you know Mall of America here in the Twin Cities. Um, even the in-person physical piece is to support the digital sales, where yeah. it's the okay. Our stores can serve as a, a particular thing. It's not necessarily um selling product like you would a, a jc penny or a kohl's or a you know bloomingdale's um but for certain people and and i'm totally included in this if i'm going to buy something i want to feel it first to know yeah. you know yeah. okay that yeah. that's not too thick that's you know that's not sure. too thin um right. this white shirt's not see-through <laughs> right um, <laughs> But then also, um, it, fashion has a particular problem in that one designer really fits me. Another mm-hmm. designer, it looks like I'm squeezing into something I shouldn't be wearing, right? Sure. Even though they're the same size, they're targeted to the same, you know, right. midlife male or whatever you want to say. Um, so, yeah, you have to go try on. You have to go see if it works. But with these these new ones, at least the experiences that I've had with a lot of these um, newer brands, you're essentially driven to the iPads that are set up around, you know, the the only desk in the entire space to then buy 
the version of it that you want, right? Because they only have that shirt in red. Well, you know, I don't look good in red. So I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to have to go get the blues or the blacks or the whatever, but then they'll just ship it to me. Sure. That is a totally different sales model. Yeah. And the store has a totally different function um, in that case than, um, than that kind of traditional. Yeah. I guess we've talked about it a couple different ways of, the traditional retailer, traditional service provider shifting mm -hmm. over to a digital mindset. And then there's those who are in the digital first shifting over to how do you basically expand, break into new markets, um, widen up basically the assortment. You do that possibly through retail and going back to that kind of brick and mortar experience of how do you build in that area and that you can attract, you know, new, new set of clients, new set of customers to it. Mm hmm. That's a and this, yeah, and this is fully back to my thesis that SEO is the business, right? Yeah. Because if you're going to have store locations, if you're going to have um, physical experiences, you're going to also want local SEO. Yep. You're going to want the reviews. You're going to want right. all the citations, all of the traditional promotional stuff that you're going to do around opening up a new location, like the PR, the, um, mm -hmm. the news interviews and all of the other things that you're going to try to do. All of that goes into what is that SERP experience when I type in brand XYZ, right? right. Or product XYZ. Yeah. Right. Right. Is it within yeah. 25 miles of me? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how bad are their customer service reviews? Like, do I really want to go? Right. Like, yeah. you know, and then as you get more and more specialized, like in particular, the guitars that I'm into, um, they're <laughs> frustratingly, there's only one or two stores in over a hundred mile radius that sell yeah. the particular kind that I want. Yeah. Tell me about it. And that I like. And yeah. so that's a particular problem for me because now all of a sudden it's like, okay, I got to do a day off work. I got to <laughs> yeah. drive to this place to try it yeah. out. Or, you know, I just drop a huge amount of money for something that I think I'm going to like, but really honestly, every guitar is a individual snowflake. So you got to try it. Sure. You know? Um, Although yeah, I know that. I've been, I've been told I'm not allowed a new guitar for a while. So <laughs> <laughs> it's tough as you speak with two of them on either side of you. <laughs> I've oh, I'm down to 12. Oh, I'm down, down to 12. 12. <laughs> down to 12. There you go. Down to 12. <laughs> so, you know, I don't have a problem. Um, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, when was the last time you got a tool? <laughs> I know. I was about to say, there's, there is the same story. There's a, a woodworking store, and it is way too far for me to go to, but it is the only one around. And big box stores, there's a limit to how DIY intensive they get. And once you mm -hmm. pass that level, you kind of want some specialty stuff. And my gosh, they don't carry it. So, right. Yeah, I still haven't been there. I still be, I keep planning out this visit that I'm eventually going to do to this particular store. And it's like, it's just a little, it's quite a bit too far for me to go to on a regular day. So. Mm -hmm. There's a particular British amp that I want to try. Yeah. Um, but the closest, um, the closest retailer is in Indiana. <laughs> From Minnesota. Yeah, that's yep. a stretch. So, you know, but then you're like, eh, I'm in Indiana, so maybe I'll drive a little farther and end up in Nashville. <laughs> no complaints to those who are in Indiana. <laughs> yeah. No, but, Indiana's, uh, Indiana's might great, be more, but... Yeah, Nashville might be know, a more fun weekend. <laughs> if I'm going to drive that far, I want you know, <laughs> yeah. something else to do other than just jump in and head back, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, but along those lines, right, we talked... Um, you know, as you get more specialized, right? This is where we've also talked um, as SEOs forever and ever on the generic terms versus the long tail, right? Yeah. All of this yeah. consumer behavior, all of the discussions that we're having is exactly that, right? Mm -hmm. You can bring somebody in on the general brand awareness 
and all the activities that you would do for that. And yeah. that'll be your top level, you know, website stuff. Right. Um, but then as you get more specialized or you're addressing individual needs of your audience, you're going to have the content that is there. Right. Um, and I feel like to go back to the beginning of our conversation where we've yeah. said the technical versus the creative, I feel like organizations for a really long time have just seen, let the creatives be creative, let them do their thing because they're the ones that create all the content that bring people in. Yeah. And we'll have the technical people that will set up the, the systems that enable things to work and they can polish the content that's there. Right. Yep. But you need both. You know, yeah. you can only you can only polish crap so much, right? You there's, need <laughs> to do more stuff. Yeah, right? there's a major retailer that um, I don't want to name them because I mean it was it was pretty tragic, but they deleted their entire site and redid it with something that basically looks like the weekly flyer that they used to mail out. <laughs> they had the Ouch. team who was in charge of the flyer basically recreate the entire site, and not surprisingly, it didn't index well. And it didn't get much for traffic. And it basically shot to the bottom pretty pretty darn fast. It was just this, like, are you kidding me, sort of moment of how does a nationwide retailer think that that's a smart call and a good idea? But it still is at that same point of who's making these decisions? Do they fully understand basically that additional front door to the business? And do they see where basically those other channels play in, play a part and play in? Mm -hmm. Print catalogs aren't out and direct mail is not out. The email campaigns are not out. Facebook campaigns, heck, even you name the particular platform, those campaigns are not out because of who your audience is. If your audience happens to be there, then yeah, it's a valid place to you know throw some money down and mm -hmm. to go after. Now, this sure. next idea I want to we'll, we'll we'll have to circle back because I want Ruthie's opinion on this as well. Sure. We'll at least tease. A future episode uh right now with it but you know recently i was watching some old uh, clayton christensen videos and presentations that he did there's um i think it was one where he did like at a google employee conference or something and they, they put it on youtube but his thesis was essentially with the research that he has done uh or did before he died um at harvard good management is what makes organizations be able to scale and be very successful for a period of time but then good management is the thing that will drive them to fail and die horribly um, at the end right because when you stop innovating you start sure. managing what you have sure. which then starts yeah. the spiral down into yeah. Worse culture, less innovation, harder yeah. time hiring people, you know, all of these things. Um, it's, it's a fantastic, it's a fantastic um, watch. So I'd recommend that. I'll put it in the show notes. Um, and maybe we'll give ourselves some homework on uh, to do a, deep, a deeper dive on that, that presentation. But I feel like that does come into it as well, where yeah. some, of the, some of these organizations that, that we see, to your point, we've always done a weekly thing. That's what drives people into the stores because I see the, I see the brochure or the flyer tucked under their yeah. arm when they grab the cart or they exactly. you know, look at the car. So let's just do the brochure online and that'll be fine because they'll buy from everybody else. And you're like, yeah. mm, nope, this is a channel you have to optimize for that. And uh -huh. You know, the person that's yep. making that kind of decision is trying to optimize the budget that they've been given in order to hit the growth goals that they've been given, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, it reminds me of there's a Denny Hecker. Um, he had a billboard and it bugged the heck out of me because I ended up driving past it every day as I went to work. It was literally like a section of the classified ads as a billboard like impossible to read font right and just tons and tons of text all over this billboard and every time i passed it i kept thinking 
who do you think you are? That was the dumbest idea. It took me forever in the you know daily commute to finally even understand who put up the billboard because you know the text was so small. It was just one of these like mind-blowingly dumb things that you know sometimes gets done in marketing and Mm -hmm. A lot of people get exposed to it, sadly. <laughs> not, not a great brand impression. <laughs> you know what? Uh, there was one really good exercise, or at least my my way of getting around that when I was in the agency side. Yeah. Um, you know, because you get the client feedback on yeah. the billboards or whatever. And, you know, we need to have this because this is important to blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Like, no, you don't. Yeah. yeah. So you took a TV, you put it in the corner of the meeting room. You put the billboard design on the TV and then you have everybody sit where you're facing away from it. Yep. And then you say, glance at it and come back. How much information did you get off of that glance? Cause that's what you're getting when people are driving by. Yep. And then yep. it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Get rid of everything else. <laughs> <laughs> we did a similar, a similar thing. It was uh, kind of a flashcard kind of thing. We had to print it off. Basically, it was like, okay, this is your design. Okay. Do you like it? What did you think of, like, you asked very specific questions. What did you think of this element or this, this element? And it's like, well, no, I need to see it again. And it's like, well, you can't yeah, because you drove you past it already. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to buy a series of billboards down that particular road. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I've seen that done. South Dakota, North Dakota has that. <laughs> if it's cheap enough land, you can do it. <laughs> God. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. All Good. right. So I know uh, you and I both have hard outs here. So yeah. in, in the final section, um, I guess, what are your thoughts with the technical versus the content piece? I think it's getting tricky. I, I will mm -hmm. say it's getting tricky because if you're a large enough organization, uh, Target, Walmart, some something large like that. You're going to have a hard time having just one SEO who can be holistic enough, basically, right. to cover those two areas. You have too many teams, too many large scale content teams, you know, agencies, PR groups, you name it, that are constantly doing stuff in a given week. And code launches, technical changes, you name it, that is also happening in that same week. You're going to need talent. Mm -hmm. So I think we're starting to see a shift where you do have, you know, split talent, but the big thing then becomes who's going to tie it together and the team. So speaking of management, good management or bad, I think you have to have some sort of a manager who can understand both, knows both, has that experience, but their main focus is tying it together, keeping it holistic, keeping on that big picture. And talking to those teams and making sure that they know what each other are doing and that they're moving in the same direction. Right. Because both can go off in their own direction so fast. And it's fine. They'll do great. But it won't be that good. And that's that's where I think that key piece kicks in still, that you know, that kind of head of SEO piece. And we'll do it for a later episode about talking about like head of search versus head of SEO. Mm -hmm. How do you kind of create that? How do you ladder that up in a way where actually te teams are actually working together? Um, innovation cycles, you know, speaking of like you know, stagnant companies, how do you bring in an innovation cycle to kind of boost things up again? Mm -hmm. you know, hackathon, you name it, you know, there's, there's methods there. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, that's a difficult question. I think it's getting more and more difficult as time goes on. Mm -hmm. And when we have Ruthie back, we'll definitely get into kind of an AI conversation about where content goes, the importance of it, the creation of it. How much do you need to create like mm -hmm. mobile searching? People are very verbose. Speaking of long tail, they go super long tail and they're searching for things that it's a combination of phrases that have never been, never existed before. Right. It happens all the time. It's going to change. If you want to see a really interesting debate on the, um, the content side of things, yeah. go to chat. GPT's Instagram profile where they show all of the Dolly, uh, or I should say open AI, right? Yeah. Um, they have their Dolly images and they basically showcase what some people have done with it. Now, anybody who's been in the content game long enough will realize, okay, so that's the Dolly creation, but they're combining it with this particular Photoshop, you know, yeah. template. Um, yeah. And 
some of them are very cool, right? So if you click sure. into any of them, start looking at the comments <laughs> and you have the true believers and you have the, the people who don't want it to be happening for sure. Yeah. Um, and then all the passive people in the middle, but it yeah. is, it's a, it's on the one hand, it's really cool to see how everybody is approaching it differently. Um, but it does reinforce in my mind that AI and the tools that are built off of it, they are a boost to what you are already good at. Yep. You know, the fact that I could have a robot write code for me doesn't change the fact that I don't know Python right now. Right. And do I go yeah. and so if I have, do I trust it? If I say, write me a Python script for this, that, or the other, maybe, maybe. But do I want to launch that on anything that I would represent people for or myself or would have an impact on, on the perception of me or in brands that I, I represent? No, absolutely not. I'm not going to take that risk. Um, but for individual creators, you, you might start seeing some of those things, you know? Um, yeah. So it is, it is an interesting, interesting debate. Um, anyway, so last few minutes, last section of the show, what's your recommendation for this week? Um, I'll, I'll put in the show notes, but it's the Will Critchlow presentation about kind of his experience of search and some of the trends. It's really good because it's not just talking about the trends that we know about. He's talking a lot about where did we first see evidence of those trends and where did that go? So that you can kind of get into an inspirational cycle of looking at things and saying, yep, I see that this is a teaser of what's to come and this is important and I should pay attention to it. I've, I really like that aspect of that presentation. So I'll find that one and share it out. Cool. And yourself? Um, so I might be really late to the game on this, but um, I recently rediscovered an artist that I listened to a lot, like <laughs> six years ago. Um, and then just kind of stopped for whatever reason, right? Yeah, Britney Spears was cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't no, him. it was no. no. Um, okay, but it was Dead Mouse. Oh, for, yeah. You know. Yeah. And I, for, I forgot how good those first couple of records are. So I've been revisiting yeah. those. Uh, but my recommendation is not Dead Mouse. My recommendation is on Apple Music, mm -hmm. they now have at the bottom of the profile, the record company of the particular thing as a click. So then it becomes a collection of all of the releases from that record company. So as a way to discover new music That's or cool. artists that are similar to yeah. what you're listening to and you like, yeah. you can, you know, go on that. So, um, you know, I know a lot of people are always like, man, I listen to the same stuff because I just don't know how to find new, new artists yeah. anymore. Yeah. Um, that could be a cool way for people to discover things. Cause I know when I've done that, I've realized that almost all the artists that I like to listen to are out of like one or two particular record companies. <laughs> I can imagine. So, that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, check it out. Look at the metadata because metadata does make for new fun features, uh, in certain things. They can be absolute headaches too, but, um, yeah. 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 That's good. So anyway, everybody, thank you for hanging out. Uh, let us know what you think on anything that we've covered here. I know we've, we've circled around a lot. We've covered a lot. Um, technical versus holistic SEO. What are your thoughts? Content creation. Um, let us know and uh, stay tuned for the next episode after you have liked and subscribed and helped out the show. So uh, take care and we'll see you next time. That's it. Thanks, all.